Good. So I was in Salinas yesterday meeting with some pediatricians and heard stories of little kids really sick getting the health care that they needed and the medical services that were really going to save their lives. And it was a very inspiring meeting. But then I got in the van to drive back to my office in Scotts Valley, and as, as I was driving through Castroville, you know, right about where the giant artichoke is, right next to that is a schoolyard. And recess was in full play, and there must have been 100 kids out there, dressed colorfully, playing jump rope, interacting with each other. I didn't see anybody getting bullied. I didn't see any kids kind of isolated off to the side. And there was nice fencing all around the schoolyard so that the kids were safe from traffic. And I thought to myself, you know, I just heard a lot of great stories about medical care. And then I was witnessing evidence of children's health. And what our panel is going to do today is kind of ask the question, health and well-being for kids in our region, how are we going to get there? And they're each going to share stories from their own professional experience that will illustrate pathways to that health and well-being. So does it just take more insurance coverage? That's a good thing, but it's not enough. Better access to doctors and high-tech medical gear? That's a good thing, not enough. We're going to take a look upstream at some of the social factors that also affect health. But first, let me kind of share a story that will get us kind of set the stage a little bit. It was my first day of class at the University of California in the School of Public Health. My epidemiology professor stood up in front of the class and looked around just like this and said, some of you are going to die in car crashes. Others of you are going to fall off a ladder and break your neck. But most of you are going to die from 100 small decisions you make every day. So you know, we were all 20 and 30-somethings, immortals. And it was like, yeah, right. But we were listening and, and really heard the message that it's not just medical care that determines our health and our longevity, that it's also our behavior, our self-care. And as we learn more, we discovered it's also our zip code, and it's nutrition. It's our education environment and other social factors. So if we think about it that way, and we think about nutrition, what is it that we're feeding our children, and what can we afford to feed them? Can we encourage them to go out and play after school, or is their neighborhood not safe for that? And how about education? Is it accessible and affordable for them? Because education really strongly correlates with health status. So right now, where we live in our region, this beautiful region that we're so in love with, really matters in terms of our health status. Zip code, definitely. And so this day in our panel of stories is really about guiding us towards an upstream culture of health for children in every part of the region. So let's take a little look at what causes health and well-being or premature death. And I have to say, when I looked at this slide, uh, my head kind of exploded. Medical care, 10% driving premature death. So look at some of the other factors on there. Uh, behavioral health, social factors, environmental exposures. Now, don't get me wrong, when you really need a doctor, you need one. And doctors are also a great source of preventative care. But the upstream factors here are critically important. Just a word about the Affordable Care Act. We're getting a lot of people covered for the first time through the Affordable Care Act. But our work isn't done. It's not just about access to medical care. It's about creating a culture of health in our region. So what might that look like? What are some of the factors? This nice little wheel kind of illustrates what that model could look like. It's a web of social factors as well as medical care. We can see that health is not just MRIs and surgery. It's also housing, education, and income, among other factors. So now we're going to ask our panelists to look kind of beyond the exam room and into our living rooms and playgrounds and grocery stores and discuss their views on how we can build a culture of health for the children in our region. How can we help them thrive, like those children I saw playing in Castroville? And what new partnerships and initiatives could help us move the needle on those social determinants of health? So our panelists are listed here. Their CVs are in your materials today. Uh, I know these folks. They have some great stories to tell. 
And after we hear from them, we'll have a brief panel interaction and then take Q&A from all of you. So our goal today is to envision a path to truly create a culture of health for all children in our region. So let's get started. And I'll ask Dr. Larry Digitaldi to tell his story. Yeah, well, good morning. Can you hear me okay? No? Okay, yeah, I saw it. Mike. Hello, hello. Getting better? Okay, okay. I'll go down. Um, I, I saw that John D's in the in the room, so I'm gonna if I put my coffee cup up here, John D, it's not quotable, okay? So um, the um, uh, the Yeah, I really don't think there's any immunity, okay. Larry. Okay, so. rats, okay. Because <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to hit four things. I'm going to go a little bit into history because uh, I've been I'm, uh, been here a long time, Santa Cruz, since 1972, except for those painful four years at USC Med School, which I try to forget. Um, so uh, I'm going to touch on um, Hogwarts, 100,000 faces, and I'm going to talk about two patients that affected me, uh, 1995, one in 1995 and 2003. The first. You know, in the beginning of Hogwarts, first day at Hogwarts, what happens to you? Um, the sorting hat, right? The sorting hat. You determine what, where you're going to be when you grow up, what school you go into. And, and the, the real sorting hat experience for physicians is not what med school they go to. It's the first day or the beginning of their fourth year. They put on a sorting hat, and they take it off. And they decide what specialty they're going to go into. So, and when we, when doctors meet another doctor, we don't care what med school we, they went to or where they trained. We more care about what their specialty is because we have biases inside medicine about the kind of specialists that, you know, the kind of doctors, the brilliant doctors like Nan Mikwitz, who becomes an infectious disease doctor. Uh, where's Nan? She's somewhere out there in the back. Um, <laughs> washing your hands. <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, but, you know, Alan showed that slide about sort of the intersection of public health and medicine. What specialty of physicians, and I'm a family doctor, it's a, this is an easy answer, softball answer. What specialty is closest to public health, closest to sort of the, the progressive approach to expand coverage, to develop medical homes, uh, to embrace preventative medicine? W what specialty has led American medicine around those kind of very positive changes? What specialty? Pediatrics. Pediatrics has actually been, and it's one of my favorite specialties because these are the folks that drive change and, and when they stand up and tell a story are most compelling. So the, the, the 100,000 faces uh, fact of being a doctor is that's about how many patients. If you work a full career, 100,000 different people you will meet or patients, encounters you will have in your career. And we forget most of them, but I want to tell you about two. And, but we do remember the great ones and, and sort of the, the tragic ones. So we remember those, those patients very well, and particularly early in, our, early in our careers, the patients that really defined who we are and want to be. In 1995, I was 10 years in Santa Cruz practicing and 11 years in urgent care. And I, uh, a child came in, and, and the, the thinking back in the, in the 80s and 90s around sort of healthcare finance, um, most physicians were trying to avoid Medi-Cal patients in, in California. And basically, and that was a, that's a fact of life, and John D., I'll put that up there, a little late on that one, but that was a fact because the Medi-Cal program, Medicaid, for low-income Californians was run out of Sacramento, it was not popular, they paid poorly, they, they did not cover a lot of the things you need to do for patients. It was very disengaging for physicians. And uh, so all of us felt that, even the pediatricians were struggling with uh, dealing with a program that covered low-income children that was underfunded, under-resourced, and uh, did not value the care that they provided these kids. And then, and, and about that time, I, I was, uh, I pulled a chart off the door, and it was a four-year-old kid, and it was a four-year-old medical patient who I'd never seen before, and I saw that he had excessive thirst and excessive urination. Th those were the, so I went, before I went in and introduced myself, I went to the medical assistant, I said, did you get a urine? Because it was pretty obvious that this was probably a new onset diabetic. And she said, I did, and we went over and we dipsticked it, and in my brain, I was thinking, that this is going to be a very sick child because new onset diabetes in a pediatric patient 
in my mind, was always type 1 insulin-dependent diabetes. And I was thinking, this kid, I'm going to go in, he's going to be in, in the early stages of uh, ketoacidosis. This is an ICU visit, an ambulance visit. And I just wanted to do that quick dipstick to see what was, was showing up in, in the urine. And his, his glucose was off the scale, but he had no ketones, which completely blew my mind. That means he was looked for all the world like an adult onset diabetic. And I walked in to see this four-year-old, and he weighed 125 pounds. And I, a couple of things went on in my head. Oh my God, there's something weird here. But it wasn't weird. It was the beginning of, of, an, of a new experience with pediatric obesity. But the other thought I had was, who am I going to get to care for this kid because he's a Medi-Cal patient? I got a pediatrician to come down. We admitted him. And I asked her, it was Chris Grigger, I said, you know, this Medi-Cal program is so frustrating. And she said, wait, Larry, there's a new approach to Medi-Cal. This was 1995. It was the year this guy came in to disrupt health care in, in Santa Cruz, where we set up, we took the care away from Sacramento. And then we, we, we established a local governing board to manage the uh, Medi-Cal delivery system in Santa Cruz. It was so popular, so successful, that five years later, Ray and Monterey County joined, and then 2010, Merced joined. And the basic approach was local care should be uh, de delivered locally. We should um, own, this community should own the approach to the care for, for our Medi-Cal patients, and we ceased to think of them as Sacramento patients on the physician side. We were forced to realize that these were our patients, our, our members of our community, and it was, and that kid found an endocrinologist, that kid found an, a medical home. Um, I don't know how he's doing 20 years later, but it it was for me a sort of a breakthrough moment to realize uh, that the Medi-Cal program, and today there's 13 million Californians on Medi-Cal. One in three Californians are on Medi-Cal because of the ACA. And uh, the vast majority of them, I think over 10 million, are in uh, programs managed Medi-Cal, locally delivered, um, like the Alliance. So it's a much, much better world. Access is great, and the physicians are engaged. So that was in 2003. Um, another day, another kid who was 17 but looked about 14, I knew his dad, his uncle, moved up from Mexico, he was undocumented, and he had knee pain. And, and uh, I knew his, his dad, I played soccer with his dad, and, or his uncle, and I, I, they were paying cash because that's the only way that this kid could get care. And the care had, his knee pain had been going on for 12 months. And I went in and I looked at the knee and I realized it was really busy. I need an x-ray. I'm, I'm going to just do a brief exam. I remember thinking, this is weird. And when I took the, I, the, the, the thing I remember about this kid is putting the x-rays up. This was before electronic uh, 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 images. And it just hit me that this kid's, this kid's entire lower femur was uh, was gone. It was replaced by you just see cancer. I mean, sometimes cancer appears on an X-ray uh, with a big C. And this 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 child had the most advanced form of osteosarcoma, the, the what Ted Kennedy's uh, son had uh, that I'd ever seen. And I realized, oh hell, this kid's got a horrible road ahead of him, and he has no insurance, not eligible for Medi-Cal. And um, it's 2003, and it's it, it was. A, one of many stories that led Santa Cruz County to invest in a program called Healthy Kids, which we kicked off. She helped lead. Uh, David Brody's in the audience, which the Santa Cruz County said, whatever we do with undocumented residents, we're going to find a way to, to provide health insurance for kids. And so we have struggled and limped along, but we have tried. Our, you know, our commitment has been both on the care side and public policy side, cover all children. And the, the great news, and uh, Bill Monning's not here, but the state legislature completely surprised us by passing um, effective beginning May 1st of, of next year, all children in, in California will be eligible for Medi-Cal, irrespective of, of documentation status. We started this, yeah. So I just, I'm reflecting, I, I've kind of gone from medieval times to sort of uh, 20th century now to 21st century, and it's just really gratifying. And I, I three of us are on his board, and th this guy is just a, a superstar. He has transformed uh, 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 care for low-income people, and it's been a 
great, great journey to be on. Larry, thank you. And I do want to remind the panelists to share only stories that reflect very, very positively on me. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go next to Leslie Connor. Leslie. Well, that's easy, Alan. Um, so what I'm going to do is share some sort of headline stories. Um, I run a community health center in Santa Cruz. We have a downtown women's health center that's been there for 40 years. And we have a new health center, a family health center in Live Oak. And then I'm going to share a couple of thoughts um, around strategies um, and then throw out some ideas that we're working on. And, and maybe you'll be interested in joining us. So uh, first, some stories. Uh, we serve about 660 patients who are homeless. About 100 of them are children and youth. The Live Oak School District has 179 children in it who are homeless. One middle schooler whose family has been more or less chronically homeless for years has missed a lot of school. She, has to, she had to repeat second grade. She's struggling now and way behind. And she says she feels like she's stupid because she can't keep up. Um, one of our Spanish-speaking nurse practitioner makes home visits to new mothers and their babies. She goes to far-flung areas of the county, often doing exams in mobile homes where two or more families are crammed into a small space. She's been in places where there's no heat and there's no place to sit. Uh, one of our patients has been participating in a group vet medical visits, which is far facilitated by a Spanish-speaking nurse practitioner. Um, through camaraderie and support, they share tips, they get um, health information. Um, her blood sugar is finally in control. And she said it was because the group reminded her that she mattered. Um, we've seen some amazing kids who are working through incredibly traumatic circumstances, domestic violence, street violence, deportation. One child has been seeing one of our therapists while her mother has been in jail. For a half hour, she works out the confusion about her mother disappearing and leaving her with a stranger. Her mom comes home in December. And finally, uh, a couple more. Um, there's a patient we have. He's a third generation Santa Cruzan. He recently became insured thanks to the Alliance and the Affordable Care Act. He told us he'd been waiting 19 years to have his own primary care provider. And finally, one of our physicians, uh, in, a, in a peak of frustration, sent an email to us, several of us, and she shared about her morning, that morning, her slate of patients, just the morning. There were six patients, six appointments, and in one form or another, they simultaneously and alternately dealt with abuse, homelessness, mental illness, poor diet, hunger, addiction, and acute dental problems. So what can a physician possibly do to address these issues in a 15 to 20 minute doctor visit? It's not possible. So my point here is not to overwhelm with all these negative stories because we are here to think about solutions and it does feel like there are pivotal, um, there's pivotal thinking happening in that regard. Um, I also want to note that personal responsibility is important, obviously, um, when you think about recovery. Uh, our therapists and providers talk a lot about personal responsibility and people um, uh, reaching uh, their recovery goals when it's right for them and in their own way. Um, but we're also talking about social responsibility here today, and I think that's a really important piece that we want to think about. Um, health shouldn't be random, it shouldn't be linked to zip code or your wallet or the color of your skin. We have a moral imperative to uh, address the needs, uh, the health care needs. Children um, suffer when they are exposed to environmental factors like trauma or abuse or homelessness. Um, parents who lack education themselves and can't support their kids um, to learn. Um, and so really, health happens right when you're born and in those first few years of life when your brain is developing. Um, and those are, the, those are the moments that we need to act. Um, but it's not just a moral imperative, it's also an economic imperative. Um, in less than a generation, the majority of the country will be people of color. There will be a minority majority. And so the odds are against kids who often are from minority families. The odds are against them achieving their own potential. And when they don't achieve their own potential, we won't either because our fates are shared. So I think it's good to look at data, but I think it's also important to de-aggregate the data so that when you look at unemployment or homelessness or um, 
uh, uh, teen pregnancy, you're going to see drastic differences based on income and race. Okay, so now we get to more positive things. <laughs> um, so. I, I think about solving these problems every day, and so the three things that occur to me um, are the complexity. And they say for every complex problem, there's a simple and easy solution, and it's wrong. <laughs> we have to go beyond the single problem or project and focus on systems. So when we're talking today, it can't be a random uh, nutrition program or a transportation project. We really are looking at systems change. Um, and that means an intentional focus on the intersection between systems, economic development, housing, mental health, food security, safety, education. Um, my nonprofit partners, um, we have to step up too because too often when you look at collective impact models, they go wrong when an assortment of nonprofits come together and they're looking for funding and it's about referring people between organizations and the community itself is not in the room and it becomes um, something far less impactful than, than we would hope. Um, Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is we have to hold ourselves accountable. Besides system change, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to have intentional goals that are measurable and that we're all focused on. And if you're not part of the solution to those intentional goals, then you need to step out of the way. And if you are part of the, part of the solution, then you need to step up. Um, and then... The third piece is community engagement. Um, the grassroots have to be engaged. We have to check our white privilege. We have to find out what the community is interested in. We're doing a project in Live Oak where we're trying to engage parents um, about what they want for their kids, their dreams for their children. Not surprisingly, they want what we all want. They want good health for their kids. They want good education. And they want their kids to have good characters and be good citizens. Um, and they're a fantastic group of parents, and we're learning a lot from them. Um, OK, so those are the strategies. Systems, holding ourselves accountable, being intentional, and engaging the community and being led by the community. So some solutions. Uh, Cradle to Career is a project that we're working on in Live Oak. And um, it's all about investing early and following children through school. So in our clinic, we would start with a family in prenatal care when they're um, expecting their child, and we would follow them through a preschool, get them ready for kindergarten, get them ready for first grade, make sure they achieve their proficiency by third grade, and we follow them all the way through middle school, high school, and beyond. Um, the idea is to make sure that each child has what all our kids have, which is this wraparound support and pipeline to success. Um, children need to be safe and loved and nurtured in their first years of life. Um, what if every child in Santa Cruz County started kindergarten with a college savings account? There's a housing trust idea. What about a trust in our children, um, funding their um, uh, financial resources, funding their financial under knowledge and literacy so they can start thinking about um, their kids? Because a lot of um, the, the parents we're, we're working with, they really don't know what's up ahead. They really don't know, and they're not prepared. Um, OK, that's the first idea. The second is Pacific Station downtown. I'm really excited about the possibility of the metro development in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, Bonnie Lipscomb and city council members have expressed great enthusiasm for the project. It's going to take a lot of money. But the idea would be to build an integrated live, work, mixed income space where you have our health center, you have affordable housing, um, and um, we would work with Encompass, we would work with Dientes, we would work with all kinds of services um, to wrap around for the families that live there. We may be, maybe the health center would buy some housing units and um, house community health workers to provide support to our patients. Okay, the third is mental health and substance use. It's huge. I'm getting the... I'm getting the the wrap it up sign. Okay, substance use, we, there are ways of um, integrating behavioral health, increasing acute treatment, more supportive housing, decriminalizing drug offenders, and increasing treatment. 
Um, and finally, an equity agenda. There's a group called Helga, and we are working on an equity agenda for Santa Cruz County, which would be a filter, an equity filter, so that when we make, when we make decisions about development, housing, and policy decisions, we're, we're making sure we consider who is impacted, because remember the shared fates. We have to make sure that we're all um, achieving our potential, regardless of who we are, where we come from, what language we speak, what color we are, and um, it's in our all our best interest to make sure that we have an equitable community in order to be a healthy one. There. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I hope it's not too late for you to run for president. <laughs> You're up, Ray. Well, is this mic on? Yes. I probably don't need it. Um, first off, I just wanted to acknowledge a group of people that came with me today. Uh, earlier, Bud introduced the elected uh, leaders of our respective communities, and I thought it would be appropriate to just ask the real leaders of Monterey to stand up. Uh, we have a community empowerment uh, program with the health department in Lossie, so could the Lossie graduates stand up? The One of the things that we're attempting to do is to empower the people that are on the street to, to come into city councils, to come into the board chambers and make changes, make differences. And uh, just a quick story about one of, the, one of the attendees here today. She did get up uh, before 4 o'clock. She made uh, lunches for the people on the bus going to the farms to work. She decided to come here today instead of going to work. This is the kind of dedication that we're seeing in, in this here type of community empowerment. Uh, Leslie mentioned it earlier. We need to get to the grassroots to really identify what it is people want. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be key in Monterey. The second thing, uh, you're all missing an absolutely wonderful PowerPoint presentation because when I sent it up here, I thought it was going to get loaded, but I've been told, nope, I just have to go on my own. The problem is I have a tendency to go off target and off tangent. So it's going to be imperative that uh, Alan kind of reins me in when I get, uh, oh, three, <laughs> already three minutes, okay. So uh, <laughs> we, we will try to stay on focus, but I, I really wanted to use this time to go back to a slide that Bud showed earlier that basically it's a small percentage of our health outcomes that's really controlled by clinical access. Dr. Eiten did a, a a study in Alameda, and out of that study came the saying, give me your zip code and I'll tell you how long you'll live. And it had very little relationship, or no relationship actually, to clinical access. The, the zip codes with the highest numbers of clinics didn't determine who was going to live the longest. So that's what has gotten us into thinking about a lot of these measures. We used to call it disparities in health, now we're talking about equity in health. And what is it that we need to do to promote equity? There's a great slide that shows these three kids, different sizes. It's actually a slide that I saw from uh, Jerry Brown's presentation. The difference between equality, you put all these three kids on the same equal level bench, trying to look over the fence, one of the kids can't see. But that's equal, they all had the equal opportunity. We hear so much about equal opportunity. Equity is, you address the fact that not everybody is the same, they don't all start in the same starting blocks, and you have to do more for some. And so we need to be th thoughtful of that as well as we move into this arena of addressing upstream influences. Um, people ask me, what is the number one health care problem in Monterey County? And I can't say I thought up this answer, but I use it all the time because one of my mentors, Jonathan Fielding, used to be the health officer for Los Angeles County, brought this up, and I agree with it 100%. Literacy, illiteracy, is my number one problem. You may think, well, what? Isn't he needing to talk about clinics and stuff? Really, if you look at the variable that is mo most predictive about healthcare outcome, wellness, opportunities for employment, coverage with a qual uh, high quality healthcare plan, it ties back to your educational level. So I just want to give, a, we were supposed to give some stories. I'm gonna give two stories. One story is a comparison between a city in our south region, I don't want to pick on anybody, and a city over in our peninsula. We have one city 
that has 64% of their residents over the age of 21 do not, do not have a high school diploma. We have another city over in the peninsula that 7% of their adults over the age of 21 do not have a high school diploma. 33% higher loss, premature loss of life in the city without the, now does having a piece of paper make you healthier? No, but it goes back to those things I was mentioning earlier. It gives you the opportunity to make choices that a lot of our residents don't have that opportunity. I was, I was just adding up when they were talking, and, and this is no fault of, against uh, Tanmer and Antle. I mean, they've done a great thing with building, and, but I just asked myself, if I had to live, even just my wife and I, on $10.25 an hour times 2,080, that, that gets me about 24,000 a year, I couldn't do that. So, but that's who we're dealing with. And so the other, the other point, and I, I wasn't successful in getting the microphone earlier when we were doing question and answers, when we deal with affordable housing, it's going to be critical, and someone mentioned it just when we were talking about infrastructure, we have to have affordable housing embedded into mixed income environments. We cannot go back to the 60s and build slums. So uh, I, it just bothers me when we've got a general plan that allows developers to go in and pay a penalty or do a buyout and say, I want to develop my McMansions here and I will pay a fine and you put your affordable housing somewhere else. If I've got 10,000, I don't, if, you know, if you've got 10,000 square foot houses, we can build and design, there's great architects among us that can put in an eightplex that looks like a 10,000 square foot house and you can have some affordable housing. Those children go to the same schools as the other children. Those parents get to live in that environment. We can do better than building low income affordable housing off in some distant remote place where we don't need to look at them. So that's one of the problems we've got to overcome if we're going to address literacy. Just one other quick story, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back down to my time limit. Quick story. Uh, a quick right. story, quick story. They, we recently, uh, we heard about COPA earlier, and Tim is here, he's, he's kind of the regional director. They brought to our attention a story of a young person in Pajaro um, who had been in to visit the emergency room, I think it was six times within eight months, because she was an asthmatic, the family couldn't afford the medication and the inhalers. That was the driving story for um, our collaborative to go to the Board of Supervisors and say, we need to cover the medications, the radiology, and the um, image or the imaging radiology and lab work for all of these people, regardless of their documentation status, so that we can provide the appropriate treatment at a more cost-effective level. Now, the, the the problem with this situation is when someone would go into the emergency room or get admitted to the hospital, the state of California was willing to pay for that. So that's why I'm so glad that they had the common sense to pass legislation that beginning in May, at least we're going to be able to cover all of our residents up to the age of 19. It needs to be expanded to all of our residents. So um, I'll just leave it at that. I, one, my last parting slide, and, and it, it's great. You're going to want to come up to me later. It's, it's, it's a picture of this uh, woman working out in the fields, and it says, if hard work and dedication created wealth, every farm working woman would be a millionaire. So, <laughs> we want to hear all the stories, so we'll go to Britt. Great. Well, I was asked to share, when we were on the call, I was asked to share a story. And I, I worked all over the country with a particular emphasis in Latino health with the National Council of La Raza in their programs. And now, as dean, reaching out to the different cities and meeting folks. And I was going to share a story about HIV and AIDS. And I will share that story and then I'll jump into my next story. But this story is about a mom and I sat with her nine month, I'm an ethnographer by trade, so I sat with her nine month old baby on my lap while I interviewed her. She had four children, the baby was the smallest, her husband was getting six and this was before protease inhibitors so he wasn't responding that well. And he was getting very, very sick and she didn't know what she was gonna do. And she sat there to me, with me, 
with tons of respeto or respect, with a smile on her face, demonstrating the ultimate levels of resiliency. And that is what I see when I go into communities every day. So in seeing that, and in seeing that in our students, and in seeing that our communities, I really feel that there's an opportunity to harness that. And I'm going to tell you one more story. I was in a Panda Express, because you can get, you know, me, we have my plate now, mi plato, instead of my pyramid. Remember when we just had a big pyramid, which never made sense to me because you wouldn't want to eat a whole pyramid. But now we have a plate, and half of your plate is supposed to be fruits and vegetables. And I'm standing in line at Panda Express, ready to get my half bowl with all the vegetables in it. And there's a little girl in front of me, and little Latina, probably six, maybe five, six years old. And she said, Mom, and she's speaking in Spanish, yo no quiero arroz, yo no quiero pasta, yo quiero verduras, right? And she's asking for her, for her vegetables. And she's saying, la mitad de mi plato tiene que ser verduras. The half of my plate has to be vegetables. I don't want the rice. And the, the mother's turning around saying, pero mija, you don't want the, the arroz? No, I, want, I learned that it has to be vegetables, and you and dad should be, and she's going on and on and on and on. And I'm thinking, wow, right? This is the best little promotora I have ever heard. I mean, she learned in school today somewhere in, in pre, I don't know where she was, but she was just reinforcing those, that information again and again. And it points me to community health workers, and it points me to what we can do. It doesn't have to all come from us experts. And I'm hoping that next year, if we have this meeting, we can have some translational phones and we'll have or some translational headsets and have some community health workers at the back. Because like your Enlace graduates, this is really what we need to elevate. And in opportunities to work with community health workers and students in health initiatives, we really learn from the strength and the resilience. And when I think what, you know, what we need to do in terms of, of um, decisions, and like Ray, I had a big PowerPoint, but oh well. Um, we need to work with cultural assets. And I keep on talking about this, and people say, well, but that's values-based. That sounds almost you know, kind of strange. And I said, no, we've got tight families. We need to really harness fam familismo or familism, you know, and how we think about our families, because kids are raised in families. And when I look at our data, we're not in good shape. According to the Pediatric Nutrition um, Surveillance System, California has nearly the highest percentage of overweight, low-income young children aged 0 to 4 in the nation. We're 45th of 46 states. That's really bad for California. I mean, we were, I would say we were down with Louisiana, but Louisiana didn't report. It was one of the four states that didn't <laughs> report. So, you know, but that's pretty shocking when we're just getting started out, right? These are kids that haven't learned yet how to read, but they're already starting from the place that you were talking about with this diabetic child. One third of our type two diabetics are now adolescents. That was something we never saw before in public health, maybe 5%, 10%. You know, you had to wait until you were 40 or 50 to be dealing with that. Now they're adolescents. We've become, and this is, these are California data, a culture of have and have nots in terms of health. So a, a greater number of children report excellent health status now than in 2009. What we're seeing is more kids are actually reporting poorer health as well. So you can see the division between those who say they're healthy and those who aren't. Um, so these are things that you know, we really, really need to get to. So what do I think are the solutions? Um, again, I think we need to work with familism. People, when people have that sense of belonging, that they have a purpose in their lives, things begin to change. And how, how much does our environment create that sense of belonging for health and human services? And that is key. People need to be able to walk in a door and feel as if they're in a very functional home if we're going to engage. Um, I think we need to build trust, or in Spanish we say confianza, with families if they're to engage and adhere to treatment or prevention initiatives to positively impact health. I think we also need to really strive, and I'm gonna say the D word, to eradicate discrimination and microaggressions so that especially our youth feel a sense of belonging. And we need to give children and youth safe places to make and safe spaces to make mistakes, right? And so the next time you see a child with a hoodie and maybe a little crack showing, not that kind, but you, we all know what I'm talking about, we need to really think about how we engage them and not automatically write them off, right? This, th this is, I think, is really important. And they need to have some boundaries. So more and more at the federal level, we're hearing the schools to prisons pipeline, and that's something that is as becoming a point of dialogue. So how do we engage them? And I think if they're 
you know, we need, we need to let them make mistakes so they don't fall into our penal system. If they're already there, we need to follow the steps of regional initiatives. And I always think of Father Greg Boyle and what he's doing with homeboys and homegirls so that they can create, we, and we can create educational pipelines or workforce training strategies so they can have some esperanza or hope. And when I look at, when I look at Monterey County, Rand just did a wonderful study and found that there's a sense of hope, right? Despite poverty, there's a sense of hope. And it's that sense of hope, particularly among our minority youth that will, and our minority families that will either take them to the next place of prosperity or not, right? So again, how do we harness that? And through the initiatives that we've, I've engaged in across the country with community health workers, I really see a lot of promise. The experts don't have to be the helicopter folks us going in. We can also create leadership there as well. One more thing I think is very, very important with students is that those students can be trained to work back in their region. And that's what we're really trying to do with the College of Health Sciences and Human Services is create more programs and create pipelines. And I think particularly because I've been out to see Maria and Gonzalez, I've been down to King City, Greenfields, and really reaching out into those communities. How do we begin to message that hope for those families that they're educational, particularly with Monterey Bay, we're sitting right there and we want to be that regional workforce for health and human services. So as we begin to develop those programs in, for example, public health, in public administration, in public safety, how do we make sure that that pipeline is absolutely there. So exactly what you're saying, we can create perhaps a trust fund so that people can begin to save those dollars and see that future. Because I, when, in working with one Latino family, I remember the parent saying to me, but you know, she's not, she's not really working, she's reading, right? And she's studying. And I said, oh, senor, right? This is real work, right? This is what's going on. This is exactly what she needs to do to benefit the future. Because we can see, I also think we need to harness in in terms of what motivates folks. And oftentimes, it's economics, but it's also finding their passion to help. And I think we can do that, particularly with child health. So thank you. <laughs> And Oscar, you came all the way from Sonoma County to join us today, so please. Yes, thank you. Oscar! All right. <laughs> See, I, uh, I, I did what you asked. I met people, and I have my own fan club now. <laughs> well, um, in the spirit of, of cross-pollination and positive disruption, I, I thank you for inviting me here. And um, Alan, thank you for bringing up the legislation that will provide health care coverage for undocumented children. Um, as you were saying that, I was reminded of my own experience having come to this country as an undocumented child in 1981 and suffering for nearly a decade of not having access to health care. And while we had sliding fee scale, uh, my parents who still today are farm workers uh, could not afford. So we got along through home remedies and a lot of pain and a lot of um, praying. Um, but it's, um, you know, we talk about the social determinants of health. And, um, you know, not having um, status is very toxic. It, it's lonely. And um, it deprives you of that very important thing of belonging, right? So for a very long time, we did not belong we lived in the shadows, and thanks to a simple pen stroke by President Reagan that allowed us to have legal status, and in 2002, I became a permanent uh, U.S. citizen, or a naturalized U.S. citizen. So uh, I, I understand, and I, I'm humbled by that enormous gift, yet I carry a tremendous burden that millions of other children were denied access to that potential that today could have been here to deliver a speech, could have been the doctors, could have been the civic leaders. So I think we need to acknowledge that our immigrant community um, will bring tremendous opportunity and will really revitalize the state of California. And so a lot of the work that we're trying to do is really think about how can we create a collective community, an inclusive community, a community that really provides opportunity for, uh, for all. And so in Sonoma County, we have been struggling through that. And in 2007, faced with the closure of Sutter Hospital, the County Board of Supervisors convened a group of community leaders to look at the issue 
of both how do we improve the healthcare delivery system and at the same time, could we, could we improve the health status of people so that over time we would lessen the impact to the healthcare delivery system? Um, we came together, uh, these were cross-sector cross leaders, business, elected, hospital administrators, grassroots, faith community, and we quickly realized that there's not a whole lot we can do to actually impact the healthcare delivery system. At that time, we didn't have the Affordable Care Act, but there was a lot that we could do to impact behavior. And as you saw from the slide, that's really where we need to focus on the social determinants of health. So through the health action that was created more than eight years ago, and it's still going strong, um, we developed this, this vision for Sonoma County to be the healthiest county in the state, the place where we could live, work, and play, and achieve our full potential. And that is still a driving force in our community, and we have 10 broad goals. And the county of Sonoma is serving as the backbone, providing both resource uh, and the convener uh, of these cross-sector groups to tackle these very complex and difficult issues. And uh, we have a three-year plan. Uh, every three years, we have a new plan. And we're focusing on, on education. We've developed our own cradle-to-career initiative. Uh, we're focused on economic wellness because we know the strong connection uh, between uh, health and wealth. And we also have developed a committee for health, health improvement, uh, really looking at how can uh, we think differently about how we deliver health and develop a patient-centered medical home model where we are working with people to really take ownership of their health and to really have the knowledge and the ability to maneuver the healthcare delivery system. Uh, but it wasn't just good enough to look and address all of those issues because we're not going to program our way out of these, these issues that we actually have to look at some of, those, some of those institutions or barriers or practices that actually create disparities in our community. And we know that disparities are not naturally occurring. They just don't happen, right? They are the result of intentional policy and practices. And so we uh, published this report called The Portrait of Sonoma, which looks at disparities along uh, health, education, and income. And we actually have taken all 99 census tracts, and we can tell you uh, what, what life expectancy is gonna be along uh, in one census tract, and we can compare, and we can ask important questions like, you know, why is it that the community of, of Roseland Creek only has 56% uh, graduating high school versus almost 100% in the community that's only five miles away? Why is it that in the same community where almost 100% of the population has a high school graduation earn twice as much as the community of Roseland Creek? So we didn't need to, to publish this to know that there was some huge disparities, but this allowed us the opportunity to have a new kind of conversation with policymakers. And I think it's really um, a conversation about changing the narrative, about where we need to go and about what needs to change in our community. At the same time, uh, we also recognize that you know, the problems that we're dealing with are very costly because we're dealing with them when they're downstream. You know, I think in this country, um, we don't focus a lot on prevention and we like to invest a lot of money on the problem. And so uh, the, the county was faced with the choice of building a new, a new jail or actually thinking differently about how they can invest resources. So rather than building a new jail, they asked the, the, uh, the county administrative officer uh, to do a, a study. You know, what are the antecedents to criminal behavior? And are there things that we could invest in that could create a different path? And that led to the creation of Upstream Investments. This is a policy initiative that I run, and it's got three basic philosophical strategies. One, let's invest early. Let's get to the, to the issue before it becomes a problem. Let's fund universal preschool. Let's close the literacy gap. Let's close and, and build actually a safety net for un, undocumented uh, immigrants. Let's make sure that children are ready to learn that they're graduating on time. Uh, let's focus on evidence, right? We know that there's a lot of programs that we could invest in. Some work and some don't. So let's have an orientation towards funding evidence-informed practices. So we've developed this portfolio of model upstream programs where, where organizations submit their program, they're vetted through a third-party group that rates them and puts them on a tier, and that tells us, it's like a, a stamp of approval that lets us know whether these programs are having results. Uh, so it's, it's controversial, right, because uh, we're changing the, the system, we're changing the way things are get funded. And the third is around investing together. Right? No one sector can hope to solve these very complex issues. So, so we have to pool our resources. We, we have to work um, 
across sectors, but more importantly, we have to involve the very people who on a daily basis deal with these challenges, right? It can't be a top-down thing. It has to be emergent, and we have to build that political power. And so the other thing, and just I'm going to close here, two, two final points. We don't, have a, we, don't, we don't have the conversation that we need to have about power, right? Who has it? Who doesn't? And are we willing to share it? And so we have to also uh, make the invisible visible. We have huge disparities, and if we want to correct them, you know, having a program to empower people isn't going to do it. You know, people have power. We just have structures that don't allow them to exercise that power, right? So I think we need to think hard about that. And just finally, consider this statistic. In my community, and I'm sure you see the same thing here, uh, we are graying and we are browning. Right, we have a fast aging um, baby boomer population and a younger Latino population. And yet that, that segment of our community does not have the kind of political access that we need to have. In the United States, every 30 seconds, a Latino turns 18 and is eligible to vote. That's about 800,000 Latinos a year. And that's a trend that's gonna continue for the next 20 years. We cannot be a strong state unless we fundamentally invest in the leadership and growth of the next generation of leaders. I think that's where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've gone a little long, so we're gonna go right to questions. So we're gonna do 10 minutes. While we're doing the mic, let me just say, I got the passion panel, okay? Yeah. yeah. Well done, you guys. I'd like to thank the panel. Um, this is a question I've been holding on to all morning. I think it's a good, good one to bring out here. I'm Steve Bean with the Digital Nest. We're training Watsonville's local tech workforce for jobs in the 21st century. Um, I see our youth come in every day uh, to train for those jobs, which is something I'm very passionate about doing. And I also see them spending more and more time staring at our screens and their screens. And so I think this is a good thing to bring up for our health panel. I think my real question is, my, well, my real question is, can you help me? But since I want to ask a broader question than that, um, what trends, when we think about working at the systems level, what trends do we have to be looking coming down the pike? You know, so like I'm training youth to have careers in technology, but is that just going to make them more sedentary? So what are the trends that you all are looking ahead to to make sure we head off before they become the systems problems for the next round of problem solving? Go ahead. Uh, excellent question. It follows up on a decision that was made earlier well, last week uh, with the federal government approving the waiver in California, the California had asked for a $17 billion waiver that included a significant part of workforce development. Um, needless to say, that was reduced to $7 billion, and so that piece was uh, knocked out. But we're still going to move forward, in fact, as we've developed a partnership with CSUMB, because one of the things that we need to be investing in now in the workforce are health coaches, uh, promotoras, the people that can assist in the be upstream behavior change, the policy advocacy, and so we, we, we're willing to make that commitment to, to bring those types of people into the workforce. We're creating internships in our uh, organization. We've, uh, in the last three years, developed our own planning and policy uh, unit within the health department so that we can actually do a health impact assessment when something comes to the Board of Supervisors. So. We need those types of people, but um, with the integration of alcohol and drug services and mental health services under the ACA into Medicaid, we don't have enough therapists, professionals, and, and mentors in that arena. So anything that you can think of that can help sponsor that type of education, we're interested. Can 
can I say something while they're here? Yes, go ahead. So one of the things that I think about in terms of your dilemma, as I also sit hours and hours behind a screen, and as a health educator know the guidelines of two hours a day, and that includes television, and that's it, right? So is how do we create healthy workspaces, right? So, you know, just starting that from the get-go and creating, you know, making sure that we've got chairs that are ergometrically, you know, maybe the chairs with the balls on them, maybe the standing desks. Just in terms of our studies, we know that if you stand all day versus if you sit all day, it's about, I want to say, 3.2 years of lifespan lost. So starting to create those environments so those youth can then go into their places of employment and say, how can we correct this? And also putting signs up, you know, if you take just things that can get them going. Because we all know how we feel after we sit for three and four hours. We're not the most productive people in the world as well. So if we're trying to thrive, we need to create environments that will do so. So, so Britt, you almost hit on my point, and, my, and this is a point, not a question. So I see the stool is missing a leg. So we talk about insurance, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about health. But the one thing we're not talking about is the infrastructure of parks and recreation. Parks and recreation are a precursor to good health. They're a precursor to healthy being. And I have the opportunity, and so does Mayor Gunther, we both have some very vibrant parks in our neighborhoods that it's amazing to watch how the low-income people deal with this. So for example, I happen to be on a community service district board and we built a park that we got from the county of Monterey in Pajaro. That park is five acres. It was originally slated as a low-income housing site that Clint Eastwood had, tra had traded for credits to build something in Pebble Beach. This park is now run by the, uh, the Central Coast YMCA with programs and every day the, the park is crowded, and on the weekends, you can't even get in there. And so I would encourage the medical community and the health community to think about parks and recreation as opposed to just insurance, and uh, that would solve, uh, would address some of the obesity issues you folks have brought. And that's a triathlon. That is a triathlon. Uh, can't hear me, but Steve I is a triathlete. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Deborah. I'm a journalist, and my question is to Britt. I was touched by this story about the little girl, girl telling her mother about the importance of eating more vegetables. And I feel like uh, access to information about health can be one of the solutions to you know, a healthier community. Can you talk about the role of, the, of community newspapers, you know, journalism, in general, in bringing more information to the community? Well, having, having worked extensively with Univision and La Opinion in Los Angeles, it's huge, right? And now there's a health segment, and that health segment is one of the most read parts of the, the newspaper. So when I think about journalists, and I, I also think their opportunity is to bring out the voices of positive, right, examples. So when, when I was always celebrating our positive Latino graduates through different programs. I remember I had one that was undocumented and then went to become an MD at Stanford, fully funded, just amazing story. And I called our local newspaper to see if they would come down because we were graduating several folks like this. And they said, no, no, that's not newsworthy. And I said, so if I tell you that Javier Becerra is running around naked out front, you might come. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's just kind of a joke. So how do we begin, especially in local communities, especially in diverse languages, to celebrate the positive attributes, right? And you just now part of my slideshow. There's something very interesting about what's happening with California from a national perspective, right? We've led in so many ways. We also might start leading in lifespan because we found in, in a big study, national study that was done, Latinos live two and a half years longer than everybody else and nobody understands why, right? So again, when we begin to undergird this resilience and these positive strategies, I mean, in my mind, Dr. Oz should be having everybody meet a Latino and make friends to figure out how it is they're living so long, you know? I mean, seriously, there's some real positive cultural attributes and how do we build those in? I'm, Anyway, I won't tell you that I'm married to one, but, but lifespan, for a lot more reasons than lifespan, but, but how do we, how do Please we Please join me in, in thanking the panel one last time. <laughs>